Welcome to the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered, FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. Today's interview features Great Lakes Dredgen Dot Corporation, NASDAQ ticker symbol GLDD. Noble Senior Research Analyst Joe Gomes interviews Great Lakes Dredgen Dock President and CEO Lassa Pedersen and SVP of Offshore Wind Elaine Baku. Visit ChannelCheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on Great Lakes Dredgen Dock, all at no cost. And now, here's Joe, Lassa, and Elaine. With us today is Lassa Pedersen, President and CEO of Great Lakes dredge and dock corporation and elena bako senior vice president of the offshore wind division good afternoon lasa and eleni and thanks for taking the time to sit down with us good afternoon thanks for having us for those in the audience unfamiliar with great lakes can you talk a little bit about the company's history and what you do yes i can do that um Great Lakes Dredging Dock is the largest uh, provider of dredging services in the United States. Uh, we have been in, in business for the last 132 years. Uh, we are today mostly active in the United States, uh, deepening the ports and navigation uh, ways throughout the nation, both on the East Coast and in the Gulf. Uh, we have also had over the years uh, quite a substantial international operation uh, headquartered out of Bahrain in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, but uh, that market is, is not so active at this point in time. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the work that we do includes port deepenings and expansion. Uh, we do coastal restoration, so rebuilding beaches after winter storms. Uh, coastal protection, which is in the south where we have hurricanes come in and break down barrier islands and we rebuild their islands after that. And we then also uh, provide uh, habitats for birds and, and sea life to, uh, to uh, prosper after the, uh, uh, as part of the uh, marine environment in, in that uh, area. Uh, we also do some maintenance dredging, which is uh, providing the navigational depth uh, of existing channels, uh, but that market is is something that we uh, do when we have available capacity as the margins in that market is lower than for for uh, capital projects. Um, we have over the last uh, five years gone through quite a restructuring and um, as we now have a very solid balance sheet we have uh, uh, substantial cash uh, we have no draw on our revolver uh, and we are in the midst of rebuilding our dredging fleet and renewing the fleet. We are also now investing into offshore wind, which Elena Veiko has joined us to head up. Uh, and uh, it has been quite a, a journey, and I will let Eleni talk a bit about that. Sure, let's let's dive right in there. Um, it, you, know, you, you talk about the offshore um, wind now this is a new market for the company and you've commissioned the building of a subsea rock installation vessel um can you talk about the offshore wind market you know the timing the size of the opportunity yes uh the the question is is uh, very relevant to uh the u.s at this point uh the u.s offshore wind market is uh booming and accelerating uh with a target to build 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. This has been the pledge uh, from the uh, Biden administration for uh, US offshore wind. And uh, it is uh, an ambitious target uh, for the US, uh, starting um, with uh, offshore wind developments in the East Coast. At the same time, the global markets are booming in offshore wind. Uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a pledge to build uh, 150 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in the North Sea by four European countries. So it is the market is accelerating and booming both in the U.S. and globally at this point at a, at a very fast pace. So how much uh, offshore wind 
is there today compared to that 30 gigawatt you talked about? And I know you guys have talked a little bit about in the past, you've done some international work. Um, presumably, you would be focused here on the U.S. Uh, initially, but maybe down the road, would the international market also be a potential market to grow into? Currently, uh, there is very little uh, offshore wind installed in the U.S. There is only the uh, Block Island offshore wind development uh, that was developed more than 10 years ago. It is in the uh, uh, range of 30 megawatts uh, versus a 30 gigawatts uh, target uh, for 2030. Um, so um, the first commercial, so we would call this the pre-commercial phase of offshore wind in the U.S., uh, but now uh, uh, the U.S. is moving into um, commercial offshore wind farm developments. Uh, the opportunity is here in the U.S., and it is definitely here globally. And uh, we are in, a, in the right position as a marine contractor because there is uh, uh, a huge need for uh, offshore installation vessels and marine equipment to build out all of these uh, commercial wind farms, both in the U.S. and globally. So the opportunity is there. So you, you mentioned about the opportunities and, and the, uh, the need for vessels. You currently have a, a ship under construction specifically for this market. Um, what kind of details can you provide about the vessel? Uh, when do you expect it to be delivered? Um, have you had, had the opportunity to begin pre-booking time on the vessel? Um, you know, what's the competitive environment for that vessel today? And are other firms moving forward with similar builds? Yes, so uh, let me tackle uh, these multiple, multi-question here. Uh, so uh, the vessel is a, is a specialized um, top of the line high technology rock installation vessel. So uh, uh, rock installation is a big part of installing the foundations uh, for these uh, fixed offshore wind developments. There's large quantities of rock required, large quantities of rock are required for scour protection around the foundations in the offshore wind farm. Each commercial size uh, offshore wind farm uh, could be uh, as much as 100 uh, foundations installed and each one will require scour protection. This vessel um, has uh, specialized equipment and a uh, uh, fall pipe, uh, a tremie pipe uh, that uh, is uh, uh, actually automated, it is motion compensated, uh, and it is specialized to work uh, in the U.S. market and, and deposit the rock with uh, um, a lot of accuracy as required by the uh, developers of offshore wind farms. Um, the vessel uh, is also uh, uh, the latest in terms of uh, low emissions. It has tier four engines. Uh, it, it has a battery system. So it is what you would call a, a hybrid diesel, diesel and, and battery uh, propulsion system. It has dynamic positioning system. So it can um, position itself with a lot of accuracy within the wind farm and do the work with uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of accuracy required uh, uh, working next to a, a number of monopiles and foundations and working in an area with a lot of other uh, vessels installing so um, it is a large vessel it is uh, almost uh, 140 meters long uh, and uh, currently it is uh, contracted uh, to be built uh, at the Acker Philly shipyard in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, we are in the process of doing the detail engineering and, and uh, producing the shop drawings for the uh, vessel. The uh, planned uh, date for the vessel uh, to for the build to be completed is in the fourth quarter of 2024. 
Um, so uh, we are currently bidding for uh, work and, and projects that uh, uh, have installation dates in 2025 and beyond uh, after our vessel uh, comes out of the build. Uh, in that respect, we uh, were very happy to announce our first uh, major project award uh, just a few weeks ago um, with the um, uh, Equinor, the Norwegian oil and gas developer. Uh, the developer Equinor uh, works in JV with BP for these uh, large developments uh, offshore the state of New York. So we won uh, the uh, rock installation uh, with a partner. Uh, uh, it's a joint bid, bid with a top of the line uh, European um, rock installation company, Van Nords. And we will be uh, installing for the Empire Wind uh, uh, 1 and Empire Wind uh, 2 wind farms in the uh, offshore the state of New York. So we already have an award in the bag uh, and, and potentially more work coming from uh, Iconor. And that's why I'm in Oslo today and I'm, I'm talking to you from Oslo doing startup activities for the, for the project. Um, so uh, we are at the same time bidding for a, a number of other uh, offshore wind projects. Uh, installing uh, in 25 and 26 and uh, we're starting discussions about uh, installations in 2027 and 2028 and, and building a, a solid backlog for, for the vessel. Did That's I catch true. everything or, or something I missed? <laughs> no, I guess, I guess the, the one was the competitive environment in our, our other firms here in the US commissioning the same type of vessels. Are, are you guys kind of the only ones once this vessel is complete that, that you would have that type of uh, ability to to um, to do for the rocks. That is correct. At this point, there has uh, not been any announcement for uh, any other uh, rock installation vessel in the U.S. There is uh, a wind turbine installation vessel, Jones Act wind turbine installation vessel in in build at uh, the Keppel Shipyard in Brownsville, Texas. But that's a, a different uh, type of specialized offshore wind vessel. So um, there will be uh, at least two to three um, rock installation vessels required uh, in the U.S. Uh, to install the 30 gigawatts that are, are planned in this decade. And can we can we draw that line from point A to point B and say, Lassa, that that is something that uh, if things go well with the first vessel, you would look at, at building us uh, another vessel? We have uh, currently a contract with Philly Yard to build one vessel and also with an option to build another vessel as we see the market develops. Um, as Eleni was saying, uh, the 30 to 35 gigawatts of ambition over the next 10 years require two to three vessels to complete in that time frame. Uh, however, if there are some delays in, in these developments, uh, we can adjust the timing of our second vessel. Maybe you could talk about where, where, where do all these rocks come from? Um, you know, do you, are, are they onshore and then you bring them offshore? Do you pick them up offshore? Um, you know, maybe you can give us a little detail on how that all, all works. And I, I don't know if you can kind of, um, size the opportunity in a in, in a installation. Um, you know what percentage of the cost of that installation does the the rocks uh, protection uh, account for? Yes. Um, so let, let me start with the uh, supply chain for the rock. So um, there's plenty of quarries um, in uh, the east coast. Uh, uh, which have up to date su been supplying the, the civ civil construction, other, other types of construction. So the challenge here is that we need to supply the rock uh, uh, loaded uh, uh, from, from each particular state and uh, loaded to our vessel, which can load up to 20,000 tons of rock and then uh, transport the rock to the offshore site and install it there with our um, fall pipe system. 
so for example let's take the state of new york um, the state of new york while they're building out the uh, empire uh, wind uh, wind farms that we were just awarded they would like to uh, develop uh, uh, the, the state supply chains and the quarries and the loading docks and the stevedoring, the whole supply chain for a rock supply chain for New York. So uh, we have plans to uh, pick up the rock up the Hudson River at a New York quarry that has appropriate loading facilities for our large vessel. And the vessel is, is uh, a low draft uh, vessel, so it can uh, go up the river and pick up the rock and, and then go back to the offshore wind site. So that has been the process. And each state, when they um, uh, award uh, uh, offtake agreements to the developers, uh, they would like to see some local content uh, and, and local uh, rock being utilized. So uh, we've had an extensive effort over the last couple of years identifying the quarries in each one of these states so we can offer uh, local content uh, for these developments. Uh, and and uh, some states are, are, are more uh, strongly encouraging uh, such behavior, Maryland being one of them uh, that are requiring uh, local uh, Maryland rock from, from local quarries. In, in addition to doing the the rocks, are there other uh, adjacencies, so to speak, that you could possibly also bid on on these projects? Um, yes. So let me address that, and that and that uh, has to do with uh, the second part of your previous question as well. That um, for uh, the uh, um, rock installation we're uh, bidding as part of the foundation installation package for each one of these uh, developments. So the foundation installation package includes um, uh, driving the, the monopile in, it includes um, laying the interarray cables between the foundations, so it has several uh, uh, sub packages within that one, uh, one bigger package. Um, so our, our scar protection uh, in, in pre-lay, before laying the foundation, there, there is uh, typically a one layer of rock that we lay down and then the, the monopile foundation is being driven in and then we go back and put more um, uh, stabilizing scar protection armor rock around the foundation, larger rocks around the foundation. So there is uh, a number of packages and, and scopes of work that uh, need to happen as part of the installation package. At this point, we are uh, bidding for the scar protection part of it. And uh, we're looking um, to, to work with uh, other uh, contractors that, that bid uh, the rest of the packages. Sometimes we bid directly to the developers. We get a direct contract like the Equinor contract that we want. And sometimes we go through the main contractor. So that's, that's how it works. There is a lot of adjacent packages that uh, uh, are part of the same foundation installation. So the offshore wind opportunity sounds like a very exciting time for the company. Yes, it is a very exciting time. Um, we, as a company, have about a 40% market share in the dredging market in the United States. So the opportunity to grow a business in that segment is limited. So a couple of years ago, once we had to restructure the company, we looked for the growth opportunities and offshore wind uh, started to develop in the, in the United States at the same time. and that we saw as an adjacency to dredging. We are building that capability at this point in time, and it is our first step into that industry. Um, and uh, once we have taken this first step and got that uh, on its good way, uh, there are other opportunities in the offshore wind market that we are looking to pursue. I uh, just want to say that if you look at the large international contractors who are active in this um, this market, most of them started out as dredging contractors and they developed into um, offshore wind installation uh, contractors as a second part of their, their business. 
So I fully, to some degree, we are following them in their footsteps uh, when it comes to developing uh, as a company. Great. So Elena talked about the Jones Act. Um, maybe you could provide a little more detail about that, how that might provide some barriers to entry in the U.S. market um, for both the offshore wind and maybe the overall dredging market. Yeah, the uh, Dredging Act and the Jones Act require that all vessels carrying goods between two U.S. points has to be built in America, it has to be owned by American citizens, and it has to be crewed, flagged, and uh, managed by U.S. citizens. So this policy provides stability for the U.S. maritime sector, and it uh, has significant uh, economic benefits to the nation. It also have uh, a, a national security um, implication that we are able to maintain a vibrant maritime sector that can assist the nation uh, should it be re uh, required in a time of crisis. So the Jones Act is a very good um, I say protection that makes make sure that we do have a dredging industry in the United States and also maintains the maritime industry in the United States. That's, that's with, with respect to offshore offshore wind, if I might add, um, it was uh, early last year that um, um, it was uh, made into law that uh, offshore wind. Um, is part of the mineral resource uh, that the Jones Act uh, applies to. So now Jones Act does apply to offshore wind overall by, by law. Let's, let's switch gears for a second and, and just talk a little bit about the dredging market. Um, there seems to be some, some nice growth in there. Um, what, what's driving the growth in the various parts of the dredging market? Well, there's several parts that uh, drive that growth. Um, the Panama Canal was, uh, there was new locks put in place some years ago in, in the Panama Canal that provided for much larger vessels to go through the canal. And that opened up for, first of all, container traffic to not be congested on the West Coast, but they could go through the Panama Canal and into the ports on the East Coast and also in the Gulf and offload the containers there and opening up a complete new uh, way of getting goods into uh, the middle of the country, uh, to the coast in the middle of the country. So it started out with the, the port of Savannah, the port of Charleston, we just completed that deepening. Uh, we deepened the, the Jacksonville uh, port, uh, just completed Boston, uh, working on Virginia, the port of Virginia. And uh, as we go to the the Gulf, uh, it also provides for petroleum products exports and LNG exports out of the um, ports on the uh, Gulf Coast. So deepening of these uh, ports enables the export of these uh, products and it, these products can then go through the deepened and widened the markets in, the, in Asia. The other uh, part that drives growth is climate change. And what we do see is more severe storms that, re that hits the East Coast and erodes the be beaches and the maritime environment there. And that needs to be rebuilt every year. And it also affects uh, the, the Gulf, where we have wetlands, barrier islands that get destroyed by hurricanes uh, that then needs to be rebuilt. And we are also then improving the maritime environment in the Gulf uh, through creation of wetlands that also protects from um, increased flooding. So there's good growth in the dredging market in the United States. 75% of revenues in dredging comes from the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers has over the last years, every year received increased and record budgets. So just this year, the, the budget for the Corps of Engineers was uh, 8.3 billion that was just um, approved. And that was an increase by 548 million from the year before. So strong support from all parts of the political um, uh, spectrums for infrastructure improvements, 
which then drives the uh, budgets and the projects that are being um, sent a bid for, for the Corps of Engineers. You mentioned about a 40% share on the dredging side. Um, how does the competitive market there look like today? Well, today um, we call it a bid market share. So we look at the all the volume of the products that come out that is in our market uh, space. And we win typically 40% of, of that from year to year with some variations. The second largest dredging contractor is half our size. And the third largest dredging contractor is half of their size again. And then the rest is composed of uh, myriads of smaller, uh, mostly regional uh, dredging contractors that owns uh, one or two dredges. So it's, it's an, quite a competitive environment. But when it comes to larger complex uh, projects, such as port deepenings and navigation channel deepenings, it's typically where we as Great Lakes can excel. We have 20 large dredges uh, of mainly three different types um, that we apply that equipment to its right use on the projects, uh, which makes us more competitive. Now, you just announced the exercise of an option to build a second 6,500 cubic yard trailing suction hopper dredge. Um, you know, why are you undertaking this build and how will this ship and its sister ship, the Galveston Island, differ from the existing hopper dredges in the fleet? Well, first of all, they are slight, slightly larger than the, uh, the smaller part of the fleet. We call this mid-sized hopper dredge. Uh, the Ellis Island we took a commission of uh, some four years ago, was 15,000 cubic yards. Um, these uh, two new uh, vessels are 6,500, so it's a mid-sized vessel. Uh, and we have three smaller um, hopper dredges that are getting uh, somewhat uh, long in the tooth. They are, uh, will be when we get to um, the delivery of the second vessel, uh, may be ready for retirement, um, but if the market is good, we can continue to operate these vessels also competitively. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the press recently about inflation, supply chain constraints, and imbalance in supply demand for employees. Um, how is this impacting Great Lakes and how's the company addressing these issues? Yeah, let me answer the, the personnel question first. Um, when it comes to, People in, in Great Lakes, we have many of our employees who just work for us throughout their life, uh, active lifetime. Uh, they join us after university, come into our projects and, and stay for the rest of their career. So we have a very strong knowledge base in, in the company you know, experienced people. Um, then on the projects, as we are moving up and down the coast, we are recruiting um, people onto our projects. And today we see it is more difficult than previously to find the right skill set in the workforce. Uh, however, we are a very attractive uh, employer. We have a strong safety record. So, so people join the company, know that we keep them safe every day on our operations. Um, and we, our benefits and our salary structure is also strong. So we do find the labor, but it is, as I said, a bit more difficult these days than it has been before. When it comes to inflation, yes, we see some inflation uh, pressures on uh, the new builds that we are making. Steel is more expensive. We see delay in some equipment uh, deliveries. It uh, hasn't really uh, seen the delay of the uh, end date or the delivery date of the vessel, but we get some of the equipment later than what we normally would. Uh, a large part of our cost on projects is fuel. And when we bid a project, we hedge the fuel so that uh, the exposure that we have to fuel price increases are contained. Okay, thanks for that, that insight. So given all where we are today, a lot of opportunity, um, a lot of potential growth out there. What, what do you see as the biggest challenges for Great Lakes going forward? 
Well, we, you don't know what you don't know, so uh, let's let's stick to uh, the knowns. And the knowns is really that we have great opportunity out there. Uh, the treasury market uh, remains strong. Uh, the political sides of the aisle uh, in, in Congress are supportive of infrastructure improvements. So funds are being made available to the Corps of Engineers who can then make sure that we are continuing to improve our maritime and the marine infrastructure. And now with the offshore wind opening up, um, I see a great growth opportunity for the company in that market space. Um, so the, uh, the, the future for the company uh, is bright uh, as I see it. And uh, we just have to make sure that we perform well in these markets and uh, is prudent when it comes to how we develop the uh, opportunities in front of us. Well, you kind of took away my last question, so I won't I won't ask about your elevator pitch since you just gave a great elevator pitch for investors right there. Um, well, Lassa and Eleni, we, we covered a lot of ground today. I got significant insight into what Great Lakes does, its markets and opportunities. We appreciate both of you taking the time to do this C-suite interview and we wish you and the company the best in the future. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this C-Suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. View our YouTube channel for more video content, including C-Suite interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.